Essay writing is something that everyone finds hard initially. Writing clearly, concisely and accurately is a skill that needs to be developed, particularly under the time pressure of an exam. Today, I'm going to share the essay structure that helped me gain a first class degree from Cambridge University. And I'll also be walking through a first class essay which I wrote to show you how you can apply these principles to your own essays. Before we start writing our essay, we need to understand how the examiners will be marking us. Here's a rubric from Cambridge, but I'm pretty sure it's applicable to most institutions. The main marking points are number one, excellent in range and command. So this means getting sufficient breadth and depth to your answers. In practice, this means getting all the relevant points from your lectures or your course materials into your essay. Getting this breadth is important to making a complete essay, which is one of the marking criteria. And this is a tricky balance to get because in the exam, you don't, you not only have time pressure, but you sometimes have a word count limit. So you need to choose selectively which points you mention briefly and which ones you go into more depth in, and this selection will come with practice. You'll also notice there's quite a bit of points in the mark scheme if you can make your writing sound critical or unorthodox or stylish or even original. This means showing a higher level of understanding to the narrative presented in your lectures. This means instead of just regurgitating your lecture notes, you can provide some unique examples which show that you can make relevant links to what has been discussed. So one way I did this was coming up with an analogy. So in our neuroscience lectures, we had a complex set of lectures on the visual system and how the visual system breaks down different components of the visual world and then feeds this information through the bottleneck of the optic nerve, which doesn't have many nerve fibers. And then higher centers in the brain will reconstruct this as an image that we can interpret. So I thought about this problem, particularly of the uh, transmitting such a high volume of information through the optic nerve. And I thought of it like emailing a zip file. So if you have lots of attachments to send, you can compress that information in a zip format and email that link. And then the person on the other side will open the zip file and then they can see all the information which you have on your computer. It's little things like this that can make your writing stand out and sound original. Another way you can make your writing original is by including evidence of wider reading. So the amount of wider reading depends on what stage you're at in your degree. For first and second year, you're not expected to do it much, but definitely by the time you're coming to third year and you're more research focused, you want to be getting about 50% of your content from outside the lectures. Another way you can get this extra reading is also by using content taught in different modules or different courses if it's relevant to the question that you're answering. Perhaps the most important point is to make sure that you directly answer the question. There's a risk that if you have already done an essay plan on a similar topic, if you see a question kind of similar but not quite the same, that you just do a massive brain dump rather than actually directly answering the question. And this is generally a red flag for examiners as it demonstrates a lack of understanding and that you're not quite appreciating the nuances of the question. And here's how you directly answer the question. So apart from reading it carefully, make sure that you identify the command words and understand what they're asking as this will influence how you approach the question. I put on the screen some of the common command words which come up in essays. I'll leave you to read that, but just to highlight some of them, you'll notice that for compare and contrast, you're supposed to talk about the similarities and the differences between the things you're trying to compare. And even if you have something like evaluate or consider, you're supposed to come to some sort of conclusion. So you need to weigh up the pros and the cons and maybe evaluate which arguments are strongest or which points are the most relevant. Secondly, a helpful mantra which I like to follow with essays is the following. Tell them what you're about to tell them, tell them, and then tell them what you've told them. I know it sounds silly, but it really is useful because it reminds you to keep linking back to the wording of the question. Like even if you have no clue what's going on, if after each point you make, you link it back using the same wording of the question, you usually get some credit. So now to come to actually writing your essay, you should spend at least five minutes planning your answer. And in that you want to outline your introduction, the main body and your conclusion. Investing this time up front will help you organize your thoughts so that later on when you're actually writing your essay, you're not just waffling on and you have a clear idea of where your essay is heading. And hopefully this should help your answer flow better. Your introduction needs to do three things. Firstly, it needs to define the key terms in the question. Next, you should briefly outline why this is an important topic to write an essay about. And this will hopefully help to grab the attention of the examiner because if you can make some unique point here, it'll help make your essays or your introduction stand out 
from the hundreds of other introductions that the examiner would have skimmed through. Finally, you should outline the main points that you intend to make in the essay. I also like to provide what I like to call an upfront conclusion, just to give the examiner an idea of where the essay is heading. Okay, so let's look at a practice essay which I wrote. Okay, so this is an essay which I wrote on fetal growth restriction, and I wrote this essay just before my human reproduction exam in second year, and I got a first class in that exam. So you can see that I've planned the essay out here, just in these bullet points, and I like to use this as a checklist so I can just tick off the points when I'm writing the exam. I also like to include it in the file or even if I'm handwriting the exam, keeping this at the start. So just in case, for whatever reason, if I don't finish, then at least the examiners can see what I intended to write about. And now if we move on to the introduction itself, you can see that I've talked about and I've defined what intrauterine growth restriction is, and that's a failure of the fetus to reach its full growth potential. And I've said why this is important, as this can have both short and long-term effects on the offspring's health. And then I go for my upfront conclusion, and I say that the placenta is an important factor in whether like growth restriction occurs or not. And then I briefly say what the essay is going to cover. And I think this is good at introduction because it does all these main things and I don't go on for too long. And in general, you don't want your introduction to be too long. You want to get as soon as you can, you want to be moving on to your main body. Okay, so next we go on to the main body and you can see that I've used subheadings to mark my main points. And I like to use these active subheadings. So for example, over here, I've said that the fetal village tree is the functional unit of placenta rather than just the fetal village tree. And this is because I think it's more engaging for the reader and it helps get your main points across faster. My main advice for the main body is to keep a really clean structure. A simple point evidence explaining, just like we were taught in GCSE, is all that's required. You don't need anything more fancy and try to keep one main point per paragraph. This will make your writing sound a lot clearer. So in this section, I want to talk about the structure of the placenta and how the malformations of the placenta during development can lead to fetal growth restriction. So I start off by talking about the structural role of the placenta. So basically, it's an exchange organ between the mother and the baby. And then I give this hand-drawn diagram. And I strongly recommend you to use diagrams in your essays. They say that a picture paints a thousand words and it can basically save a lot of time so rather than writing a huge block of text, if you can write out a quick flow diagram, that can save you a lot of space and time. And the advantage with diagrams is that they immediately draw the attention of the reader. So if you've got a relevant diagram that's well thought out, this leaves a really good impression and your examiner will more likely read what else you've written more favorably. For the diagrams themselves, try and make them look nice. So maybe use a bit of color. So here I've used red for arteries and blue for veins because that makes sense. But you shouldn't spend too long on them. So I used to like try and make them as simple as possible. And then occasionally when I was practicing essays, I would you know, practice drawing out these diagrams so I could knew I could draw them quickly in the exam if I needed. With the diagram, you also need to make sure that it's not just randomly included in the essay. So it should be referred to in the essay. So here I think I say as outlined in the diagram below. And then each diagram also needs a legend. So this is like the one to two sentences below the diagram explaining what it's showing. So here I say figure one and then I go on to explain. Okay, so moving on, here's a good example of me developing an idea. So I'm basically saying here that the placental villi increase in surface area during placental development and in pregnancy. And this allows for the fetus to grow exponentially towards the end of the pregnancy. And this is also when the increase in surface area is greatest. And then I back this up using the Fick equation, as you can see here in figure two, which shows that the rate of diffusion is proportional to the surface area. And in the next paragraph, I go on to explain what happens when this uh, increase in surface area and placental development goes wrong. So it can lead to something called preeclampsia. So you can see that there's a flow to these points and I use the Fick equation to back up what I was saying about surface area being important for diffusion and the growth of the fetus. Finally, remember to top and tail your paragraphs. This means your starting sentence and your concluding sentence in each paragraph should link directly to the question in some way. So for example, you can see at the end here of this section, I've linked back to intrauterine growth restriction in the final sentence and I've linked that with preeclampsia. This helps you keep a tight focus on the question. You'll also notice, yeah, somewhere here and here, I've used some summary tables and this is similar to diagrams, they draw the attention of the reader. It's a good way of summarizing a lot of text into less text and so it saves you time. And particularly if you can come up with your own summary tables, so for example, those not presented to you in your lectures, it shows that you can synthesize information and this shows that you have a higher level of understanding 
and hopefully indicates that you're deserving of a higher grade. I also wanted to show you this over here. So here I've included some experimental evidence. So this is this uh, final paragraph. I'm talking about amino acid transporters which are controlled by the IGF2 gene. The experimental evidence I cite here is if you knock out that gene in the mouse model, then the mice have a 40% growth restriction, which suggests that IGF2 is an important determinant of fetal growth. And even the sentence about Beckwith-Wiedemann syndrome was content from a different module. So you can see with the extra reading, I haven't gone on a massive tangent here, but I've just laced a few extra points to back up my main argument. And this is a type of skill which will push your essays into that first class bracket. Finally, in the conclusion, we need to summarize the main points discussed in the essay. The key thing is to do this in a succinct way and avoid unnecessary repetition. I think I've done that well here. I've said that the placenta is vital in facilitating optimum nutrient transfer between the mother and the fetus. And I back this up by saying, or by talking about when placental development goes wrong, it can result in intrauterine growth restriction. And I've also briefly talked about the other points mentioned in the essay. The other good thing to do in the conclusion is to give a personal point of view if the question demands it. So in this conclusion, I've put it pretty much in the active subheading by saying, I think that normal placental function is vital in protecting against growth restriction. If the question was asking me to criticize or evaluate a statement, then I might need to go a bit further in the conclusion and say which arguments are more convincing than others or which points are more relevant and that type of stuff. Finally, a good conclusion will also give some view to the future. So what are the remaining questions in this field or what are the areas for further research? and what are the wider implications of this topic. To be fair, I haven't done this very well here. I've just kind of repeated this point about long-term and short-term consequences on growth restriction for the offspring. To be honest, at this point, I was kind of running quite short on time. And it goes to show that you don't need to hit every single marking point in the first class bracket to get the overall first class mark. Other good things to like spice up a conclusion is to add any clinically relevant information. And also if you have any extra nuggets of extra reading which relate to this topic but you haven't already put in your essay, this is a good opportunity to try work them in because again, you want to have some evidence of extra reading to show that you are a first class candidate. All right, so that was a content heavy video, but I do hope it was helpful in breaking down what the components are to a first class essay. To summarize, the main points are to read the question carefully and to focus your answer strictly on the question. Plan your answer to include an introduction, the main body, which should have one main point per paragraph, and a conclusion. The main points to getting a high grade are having a good balance of breadth and depth and adding some originality or flair to your answer. And this can be by presenting your points using an interesting perspective or by including evidence of wider reading or both. I do have more to say about essays and how to approach essay based exams. So stay tuned for future videos on that. If you found this video useful, please give it a thumbs up and consider subscribing to the channel for more videos like this in the future. I will also link to this practice essay, which we walked through in the description box below if you want to read the full thing. But anyway, take care. All the best for your essays and bye for now.